In the early 1960s, a powerful drug dealer from Harlem by the name of Pop Freeman moved his drug operation from Harlem to Southside Jamaica, Queens. It's rumored that Pop Freeman was rewarded the territory by mob boss Vito Genovese of the Genovese crown family. The territory was allegedly given to him since he didn't snitch on the Genovese crown family a few years prior. He was with the Gambino. Wow. Right? What happened was he had that knot. He never told me, he never snitched. So they gave him Queens. They gave him Queens. He thinking that's what they at home. They gave Pop Queens. Wow. Out. Wow. So he was he so pretty much he was he would be the equivalent to Nicky Barnes was in Harlem, just like you just said. That's right. Drugs have been heavy on the streets of Queens since the arrival of Pop Freeman. He ran numbers and sold heroin and essentially became the Nicky Barnes of Queens. Pop ran all the numbers and he ran on the dope. Pop Freeman was an OG and no one can sell drugs forever. So as Pop reached his 70s, he handed his heroin operation to a younger drug dealer, Ronald Bassett, AKA Bums. Bums was a natural, and it didn't take him long to reach success comparable to Pop Freeman's. Lorenzo Nichols, AKA Fat Cat, was a member of the Seven Crowns, a very violent street gang. In 1976, Fat Cat and a companion committed two robberies. Fat Cat was convicted on both crimes and sentenced to 18 years in jail, but he ended up serving only two and a half years. He did his time in Sparford, a juvenile facility in the Bronx, before he was released on parole in 1980. When Fat Cat got out, he was instantly put on to the growing drug business in Southside Jamaica, Queens, by a friend who goes by the name of Pretty Tony. After Pretty Tony put Fat Cat on, Fat Cat then put Pappy Mason on. Pappy Mason is a street guy from Brooklyn who Fat Cat met while he was locked up at Sparford. Ronald Bassett, aka Bums, was Fat Cat's prime supplier. Cat ascended to the top of the Queen's drug hierarchy in no time. Cat set up shop on 150th Street and had a team more or less of 20 people. With him, Pretty Tony, and Pappy Mason as the enforcer, they were damn near untouchable. Cream was part of the Five Percenters, along with Gabi and his nephew Prince. Prince is just two years younger than Prince. Five Percenters is an offshoot of the Nation of Islam, which is a Muslim religious and political organization. Prem had his own crew of the Five Percenters called Peace Gods. They were called Peace Gods because that's how they would greet people. Peace God. Peace God. After coming home from a bid in 1979, Prince started hanging out at 150th Street the same place where Fat Cat had set up shop. Prince saw how much money the Seven Crowns were making and wanted to be a part of it. Prince brought the idea to Prem and God B, and with their strong influence, they were able to convince 5% of members to hustle at 150th Street. The Peace Guards are now known as the Supreme Team, with Prem as General and Prince as Second in Command. Prem, Fat Cat, and Pretty Tony became really close friends, sort of like the Three Amigos. Cream soaked up all the game he could from the more experienced hustlers, including Bumps. Cream had gotten his masters in the drug game. Now that Cream is moving on up, he decided to move his crew off of 150th Street and into Baisley Projects. Cream was from Baisley, so it was logical that the Baisley Projects would be their headquarters. At this time, Colombians were heavy in the Jackson Heights area of Queens. Bumps was copping key loads directly from the Colombians. When he was arrested in Baltimore for drug trafficking, his place was taken by Fat Cat. Fat Cat figured with so much money to be made that it was no point dying in a drug war. So he called a meeting with some of the other hustlers in the area. After a night of partying at Fat Cat's Big Mac Deli, areas were split up. The Corley brothers got 40 projects. Tommy Montana got Laurenton and Hollis. Prince and Skinner were made in forces. Cornbread remained hidden, handling distribution, and everyone answered to Fat Cat. Cream recruited Puerto Rican Righteous. Puerto Rican Righteous was from Hillside and one of Cream's top recruits. Puerto Rican Righteous became a main lieutenant of the Supreme Team. Later, more Latinos would join the team. A Latino face in the Supreme Team enabled Cream to gain access to the Colombians who were wary of dealing directly with African Americans. The Colombians controlled the cocaine trade and moved weight at a wholesale price. With Spanish members, Cream could make the right connections 
deal directly with the Colombians and bypass hustlers like Fat Cat and Pretty Tony. After a raid on Fat Cat's Big Mac Deli on July 29, 1985, police found over $200,000 in cash, several guns, and a large amount of heroin and cocaine. Fat Cat was arrested, but he posted a bail of $70,000. A few days later, he reported to his parole officer, Brian Rooney. Cat told Rooney that he was just visiting a friend and had no idea that the spot he got caught with all the guns, drugs, and money was a drug location. Rooney wasn't buying the story and felt Cat had violated his parole from his 1976 burglary conviction. Cat was then remanded back to prison to complete his sentence. He wasn't very happy to be back in jail, so he ordered a few of his associates to pay Rooney a visit. Rooney was shot to death on October 10, 1985. Fat Cat was later charged for second degree murder for the crime. After Fat Cat's incarceration, Cream was the new king of queens. My eyes are getting weary. My back is getting tight. And Prince was the preem as Pappy Mason was the fat cat, the enforcer and an angel of death. All this was around the time that dealers had developed a form of cocaine, much cheaper, much stronger, and it was smokable. This was the beginning of the crack epidemic. A crack is right, no, you don't need it. Prince came up with a color-coded vial scheme, so Prem would know which crew of the Supreme Team sold what. Bimmy Crew had the blue vials, Baby Wise Crew had the red vials, Black Just Crew had the orange vials, and Prince Crew had the yellow vials. At one time, the Supreme Team had over 200 members, and it's said that Prince was the most feared of them all. The four crews were bringing in an insane amount of money, and Prem was HNIC. I'm the hip nigger in charge. The Supreme Team literally took over the Basley Project during the 1980s. They took control of lobbies, walkways, and some of the apartments, just like New Jack City, which many believe was based on the Supreme Team. If the tenants cooperate, oh, it's lovely. I mean, they become loyal customers. They don't. <laughs> it's like Beirut. They become living hostages. You're gonna set up a lab here to make the product. With the Colombian connect with cocaine and the retail crack spots, the Supreme Team was falling out of control. But unfortunately, the Supreme Team had a snitch. This belt is really a video camera, Pookie. These wires are transmitters. They'll be taped to you as if you're wired for sound. It'll pick up your communication, send it back to us. In addition to other sounds and images around you, it'll also pick up shit you can't even hear. Officer Myron Cherry of the 113th Precinct Robbery Unit had been receiving information from a confidential informant. The information unveiled a lot of illegal activity revolving around the Supreme Team. Police found out that a homicide at Gaia Brewer Boulevard was connected to an alleged $80,000 cocaine and currency robbery at 231st Street in Queens during the month of July, 1985. Sergeant Foster of TNT set up surveillance and got no knock search warrants from Judge Stephen. The search warrants led to Prem's arrest in September 1985 at an apartment in Cambria Heights. The TNT raided two of Prem's stash houses. At the first location at 116th Ave, seven people were arrested. Misdemeanor qualities of drugs and several rifles were found. The search on 231st Street led to the arrest of five people, including Preen. Seizure of eight pounds of drugs, eight handguns, and over $35,000 in cash, along with counter machines, assault rifles, counterfeit money, and bulletproof vests. The Supreme Team was the first to ever get arrested by the TNT. On May 19, 1986, Preen pled guilty to count 12 of the New York County indictment criminal possession of a controlled substance in the first degree. Supreme was sentenced, nine years to life. The bus didn't stop the team though. The Supreme team was set up like the mafia. So with Prem in prison, Prince stepped in. Whenever Prem went to prison, Prince was the boss. After Prem's arrest and conviction, he was out on bail. Before starting his sentence, he planned a big extravagant going away party that doubled as Prince's 22nd birthday. The team gathered to toast the aspiring Kingpin Prince and say a final goodbye to Prince. 
Under Prem's leadership, it was more about styling, profiling, and getting money. But under Prince's leadership, the murders and chaos was turned up. As Prince and the Supreme Team maintained what they had built, more bodies started dropping. The Supreme Team's homicidal instinct had no bounds, and as they strengthened their holds on areas, they grew bolder. The 1 or 3rd Precinct grew to number 1 on the homicide list among New York City's 76 police precincts. With all the chaos surrounding the team, Prince was constantly being arrested, in and out of jail, on a variety of charges. In late 1986, Prince was arrested on drugs and weapon charges. He trusted his man, Fat Pete, to run the drug spots and stack the Supreme Team's money. But when Prince came home, Fat Pete refused to return the Supreme Team's assets. Prince decided to send a message that will once and for all show who's boss. In broad daylight, Fat Pete got his head blown off. Message! The killing was unsolved, but a wiretap conversation between Prince and God B soon after indicated that Prince knew about it. Power equality, truth equality is what Prince said to God B. Prince even had Fat Cat's nephew, Tyrone Nicholas, killed. He was shot in the head in the summer of 1987 for stealing a safe from an apartment in the Basley Project. Nicholas had robbed two other homes before this one. Prince thought he had to teach him a lesson about burglarizing people's houses in the project by putting bullets in his body. Prince and Black Just were charged with intent to cause serious injury with a weapon after being pointed out by one of Fat Cat's family members as the shooters. Prince was placed in the Queen's House of Detention for men. On October 2nd, 1987, Prince was rearrested for an unrelated murder. Yes, there's been a damn murder. He's got eight bullets in him. It's not a murder, then it's a real complicated suicide. <laughs> they transferred him from the Queen's House to the Brooklyn House of Detention, which had a special floor for organized crime members, such as cop killers and drug kingpins. Fat Cat greeted Prince as he came through the gates of the 10th floor. He guaranteed him that his nephew would drop the charges. In January of 1988, the charges of shooting Tyrone Nicholas was dismissed. Prince was also charged with the murder of Melvin Anderson, a 19-year-old drug dealer who was shot once in the head at Point Blank Range on August 21, 1987 at the corner of Farge Boulevard and 142nd Place in Southside Jamaica. Got his snot box rocked. His TV turned off. His cable subscription is forever ended. He will never, ever, 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 ever watch another movie again. Kevin Anderson, the brother of Melvin Anderson, identified Prince as the killer. But before the case went to trial, he retracted his statement and claimed his identification was fraudulent. Kevin did this because one of Prince's people threatened Melvin Anderson's brother and his whole family. Prince definitely answered the call of protecting the Supreme Team. Prem ended up beating his case on appeal due to a technicality. His lawyers got the case overturned on the premise that the warrants were bad. In August 1987, Prem, who had a nine years to life sentence, was back on the streets after serving a little over two years. When Prem got home, he held a formal Supreme Team sit down in Basley Projects. Prem used this occasion to take a detailed inventory on the crews he wanted to meet. He wanted to know the new members since his incarceration. He wanted to know about their firepower, muscle, connects, and what locations they had. Within two months of being home, Prem made approximately a half a million dollars, but the Supreme team had a target on their back, an informant in the crew who the feds were working with. In the fall of 1987, all of the major Supreme Team members were under surveillance. On November 6, 1987, a massive force of Queens Narcotic Cops raided Supreme Team locations all over Southside, including Basley Projects. Cream was tipped off about the raid by a police contact and was able to remove 200,000 from the targeted premise. But nonetheless, authorities seized an array of weapons, narcotics, photographs and documents. The raid sent Preem and Prince back in jail. Puerto Rican Righteous put himself in charge and shut the Supreme Team down. He fired everyone, closed all the drug spots, 
collected all the money owed and handed it over to Prem's sister. The rest of the Supreme team had no choice but to do their own thing. Prem was indicted by the feds in the fall of 1987 and entered a guilty plea on a charge of engaging in a continuing criminal enterprise. He was sentenced to 12 years in BOP. The same year Prem went to prison, Prince was leader of the Supreme team again after being acquitted in state court for numerous homicides. During the mid to late 1980s, Southside Jamaica Queens had seen countless murders by the Supreme Team, but the murder of Mildred Green, a grandmother and employee for more than a decade at Big D's car service was a turning point in Southside Jamaica history. On September 2nd, 1987, the 61-year-old was working at the car service at Linden Boulevard. An argument broke out between a company driver, Joel Johnson, and a passenger, Derek Carnegie, a local drug dealer. The argument was about Carnegie feeling he has been overcharged $5. Fifty thousand dollars back at the motel. You gonna cause a scene, man? For five dollars? Five dollars? It ain't even about the money. It's the present. Another driver entered the debate, and Carnegie friend Chandler pulled out a gun and started to shoot. In the process, he hit himself, Johnson, the other cab driver, and Carnegie. All four were treated at the hospital. Chandler was charged with a shooting and jailed at Rikers Island. Mildred Green was on home, but she witnessed the shooting. The week after the shooting, Green testified about the incident in front of a grand jury. Queen's Criminal Court. This action marked her for death. Chandler's crew started threatening her to retract her statement. She refused to refute the charges. Wardell Winston, Chandler's 37-year-old uncle, and Tracy Middleton walked into Big D's on Linden Boulevard and killed Green with a shotgun blast to the face just two days after she received the threats. The city was outraged with the killing. Mayor Ed Koch even offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest of Mildred Green's killer. On October 9, 1987, a team of six police officers and detectives raided Wardell Winston's home. He was arrested and charged in the Mildred Green killing. 18-year-old Tracy Middleton was also arrested and charged in the killing. Young black crack dealers became a figure of scorn in the media. The NYPD was fed up with drug dealers at long last, they were ready to take back Southside Jamaica, Queens. A Queens resident by the name of Arjun, a Guyanese immigrant, lived at 107 and Inwood Street in Southside Jamaica. By the end of 1987, this block was overrun by crackheads and drug dealers. Arjun would constantly complain to the 103rd prison about the dealers and users. The dealers perceived this as snitching. Dealers from the remnants of Fat Cat's crew and Pappy Mason's Bebo's crew tore three Molotov cocktails at a June house. Later they threw three more, two of which crashed through the window. Before it could do much damage, a June picked them up and threw them back out. A June quickly reported the incident to the police. Law enforcement was stung by the criticism about the inaction that led to the death of Mildred Green. In the wake of the fire bombing, NYPD had cop cars in front of Arjun's house 24-7 to protect him. In one of the city's darkest moments, as drug wars reached its peak, rookie police officer Edward Byrne was shot and killed on February 26, 1988, while sitting in a patrol car on 107 Ave, guarding the house of Arjun. One suspect approached the cop car, knocked on the passenger window to distract Byrne's partner, and the other ran up to the driver's window and shot Byrne 15 times in the head. Two additional suspects who were lookouts were linked to Fat Cat's old crew and Pappy Mason's Beeble's crew. That event changed the perception and image of the Supreme Team even though they were not directly involved. Burns' murder became a symbol of the nation's failure in the war on crimes, and NYPD stepped up their efforts tremendously. Within days, four suspects were rounded up and charged. 
In October 1991, the Fed started investigating the Supreme Team after Prince and his co-defendants were acquitted of the kidnapping and brutal murders of two Colombian drug dealers. This was the first time Prince had a federal investigation. Prince was called Mr. Unstoppable in the papers because he kept beating every single case at trial. With the state having difficulty with the Supreme Team, they handed them right over to the Feds with a silver platter. In 1992, the Feds indicted Prince and his crew on a 14-count racketeering indictment that included counts for drug-related murders, drug conspiracy, and drug dealing. Twelve members of the Supreme Team were indicted in a string of violence that included at least nine murders. Prince was messed up financially for the federal case because of the two-state murder cases defense he had paid for previously. He went from having popular guns and drug lawyers to being represented by public pretenders. After being tried over and over, Prince money was drained and with snitches by members of the Supreme Team like Puerto Rican Righteous, Prince had no chance. Prince was released from his 12-year federal bid around February 1993, so he was able to attend the trial of his nephew Prince and the other Supreme Team members. Prince was convicted on multiple charges which he was tried for including racketeering, narcotics, and continuing a criminal enterprise. Prince was sentenced to life without parole. The other members of the Supreme Team, fate was the same, but a few got lucky with 13, 14, or 19 year sentences.